The following presentation features highlights from the Southwest Computer Show, held in Bristol, UK, on the 22nd of February 2020. Due to limited bandwidth available at the time and the nature of the live broadcast, the video and sound quality is not as good as we had hoped. However, we don't feel this should detract from your enjoyment of this presentation. This highlights package contains edited content from the live broadcast. The new RISC-OS Direct operating system for Raspberry Pi, as featured during our broadcast, is available now for free as a download from www.riskosdev.com forward slash direct and is presented as is and without warranty. Here is a breakdown of this highlights video. You can click the time links in the description to jump to an interview or item of interest. Enjoy. Hello, good morning, and welcome to Wi Fi Sheep Live from the Southwest Computer Show here in the heart of Bristol. It's just gone 11 a.m. GMT, and I'm Tom Williamson. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to be here with you live for the next six hours, bringing you interviews, features, and the latest news from the world of Risk OS computing. Now, the main story of the show is the launch of the Risk OS Direct initiative, a new free Raspberry Pi operating system and a new video series exclusive to us here at Wi-Fi Sheep. If you can make it to the show today, I have one of the new Risk Rest Direct SD cards, which if you are a new or returning user to Risk Rest, you can have for free from the Risk Rest Direct stand out there in the main hall, which is a fantastic initiative. Speaking of Risk Rest Direct, we have a live system here, which we can cut to. And this is our live version running on a Raspberry Pi 3 today. And we'll be using this to show various demonstrations, samples uh, from various contributors and interviewees during the day. And remind you can keep up to date with everything that has actually been going on or will be going on on our Twitter feed. We're going to take a short break now and we'll return to the main hall. This is Wi Fi Sheep Live from the Southwest Computer Show in Bristol. Stay with us. And a very warm welcome back. This is Wi Fi Sheep Live coming to you from the Southwest Computer Show in Bristol. And I'm delighted to say we've been joined by Anthony Bartram of Amcog Games. Anthony, hello. Hi. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thank you for joining us. I know it's been manic this morning, especially with the bad weather actually getting here. Uh, before we get started, do you want to just give us a little bit of background to what Amcog Games actually is? Sure. So I've been running for about five years on Risk of Best and released, um, I think, more than 10 games. I think I had 20 products listed on my stand or thereabouts, this sort of thing. Uh, oh, yes, so let's I, have a look. Yes. Yeah. So that's a collection. So like a USB, if we open it up, there's a little USB stick in there. That's, that's, it's a, it's a okay. DVD star case, which I thought was quite neat. Okay, right. right. So basically, I'm guessing because most of your games are for the Pi, which doesn't have disk drives as standard. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. So <laughs> we have here this is Amcog 2018 collection. That's right. And inside. Amcog branded You want to probably USB hand stick. over the code. Oh, <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. No, it's all right. We're, we're broadcasting such a low definition. I don't no, think it'll be a problem. Really <laughs> I'm usually reassured. Yeah, so I, I sat and it's just, people kept asking me to buy all the games I've released, so I, I put them all together. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, as part of the new Risk OS Direct release, we have two new games, well, I say new games, we have 
two original games from yourself, now free and part of the OS. Absolutely. So let's just cut live to our desktop and maybe just like to just run through what exactly we've got and what we're looking at. Sure. So we go into diversions. So we've got um, Overlord was the game that I released five years ago and then was asked to um, uh, come along to a show and then thought I'd start making more games for SQS. Okay. Because it's five years old and because th my technology's moved on quite a long way, I thought maybe it was, was time to give something better back as a, as a free app on the SQS store. The other one is uh, I originally did for the Amiga some years ago and this is an updated and much improved version oh, of right, uh, okay. Pengo basically. So this one here is a bit like Gyrus, you fly into a screen, this one's Pengo. Well, shall we, have, shall we have a look at Overlord to start with? Certainly. Now, we may get sound, we may not with this, I'm not sure, but we'll see. That's all right. Now, you have the option of playing this in French and German, which is the only game like that. Because I had two of my beta testers were abroad. And they kindly opted Quite to... Quite a lot of the risk community actually are based, especially in Western Europe, I've noticed. Oh, I've so, had yeah. to send games over to, to Switzerland and all sorts of places. Oh, places, really? Yeah. Okay. So it's been fun. I've had me ask two physical copies. So I selected English, so that makes it a bit easier. So when did this come out originally? Uh, 2015. I was writing it for about 10 months, but I got a lot faster. My most recent game I actually wrote a week ago, and took about two months to develop, or thereabouts. So it's, it's got a lot quicker. And you can play it with mouse or keyboard. And this is, you've got um, lots of music tracks. I think there's about seven in here, and you have uh, multiple missions. So we'll just go straight into it, and you tell me when you had enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll go straight, we'll go, we'll, yeah, we'll start on the first level. I think yeah, let's, let's start from the beginning and just get a general yes. just how this works. So, that's it, space to fire, and uh, you're flying into the screen. So I found the graphics are much more basic if you compared it to something like Starmine that I did recently. I was going to say Starmine, that was one, was that for the London show? It was, yes. Yes, I remember, we and covered it as part of a uh, video on Wi-Fi Sheet, yes, I so remember. So that's, that's something which is much more, more modern. Really. So you just fly into the screen, you get power-ups, and eventually you get to the boss at the end and, and destroy that. So it's so a you're, warp you're drive the, one. It's a sort of classic space of shooter, but in a kind of, instead of being yes. at the bottom screen shooting up, yes. this is you're called a, in that, the middle. Are that, you in the that's middle? right. Yeah. Well, you're, what you are is on something called a Tempest Cylinder. So oh, the okay, idea of this yeah. game is you're, you're, it's a simple way of doing 3D. And it's more, more accurately called uh, 2.5D, because it's not really 3D. It's, it's really just a flat cylinder which you're flying through. But it, it creates a different kind of way of playing a game, and it's um, a model that I really enjoyed when I was young, so I had a go at implementing it. Now, I noticed you have a sprite scaling engine in there. Well, well how no, does that no, work? So RiscOS covers with sprite scaling available. What I did to, to make it easier to program is to... Uh, to, to write a library of functions. Subsequently, I've adapted this into a little game engine, which makes it very easy for me to develop games. But if you try, you should always abstract in software. You shouldn't really try to, to use uh, things directly, because if you, if you do, you make it far too complex. Does that make sense? Yes, you abstract yeah, with yeah. complexity, and then your control code becomes very straightforward to write. So I, I destroyed it quite easily because I wrote it. Um, and this is the easy level. It comes with a hard level. And so you can change the gameplay almost on the fly? Well, in the start screen, you can select between beginner and master. The reason for that is, is that you know, it, it's more accessible if you have a, a, like a starter level. So you've got something here. You've got a little energy wall you have to go through. You have uh, time bombs and other things to create a varied form of play. Yeah. Effectively. And all the source code, you know... Uh, the way I've described that is I, I have like configurations for the levels, effectively. So that's all I've stretched away as well. I was actually going to ask you about the source code. Now, am I right in thinking that most of your games are actually written in BBC Basic? Yeah, so I... Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. So um, some of my technology, such as the sound engine, which this game is too old to include, I should mention. Um, it uses Tim Player for playing back sounds. Uh, I did the, the uh, code in Basic because it made it faster to develop. Uh, if you're writing a compiled language, you're going to have to keep compiling, trying, and then, you know, rerunning it. And also, uh, BASIC is a, a fairly a straightforward language, and I thought it would help other people understand what I, how these things work. So for all the games I've written, I wanted to try to share knowledge to help other people to, to try and develop software. So, 
all your code is actually open source, so people can actually have a look at the source code to see how things actually work. And they can take that code and use it in their oh, own really? projects. It has a bit, it's a, you can use portions of this. I would obviously prefer people not to use uh, you know, music and original graphics. Absolutely. From, from the titles. But from a source code perspective, you're quite happy to be there in the open source community. Absolutely. I feel that, especially for something like RiskOS, which is a creative platform where people are trying to learn and experiment with software development, it's uh, quite helpful to do that. Okay, shall we um, have a look at the other free offering on sure. the RiskOS Direct distribution? And we'll start with the Penguin. So you said this was a port from what? Amiga, is that Not exactly. No. So, well, I, I, did a, I did a game called Mutant Penguin in 1994 as a PD game for the Amiga. And what I did was I took the graphics out of that and then just rewrote everything. Um, so this doesn't play the same and it's got uh, obviously different uh, effects in music, etc. What are the sort of differences between being a developer for the then Amiga platform and for RiskOS now? Um, well, when I was doing it, there wasn't really the internet like we have it now. We had Aminet, which I used to upload to, which was FTP-based primarily. Um, and there were PD libraries and things like that. So it was people that I knew were using the Amiga platform immediately and socially, which is what I was doing it. Uh, on RiskOS now, you've obviously got these wider communities available. Um, you've got the Raspberry Pi, which is lovely and, and cheap, um, which creates a, a realm of opportunity yeah. for people to, to, get, to get involved with it. And it was always more expensive years ago. To, on Absolutely, yeah. 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 Okay, so sorry, I cut you off there. We'll go no, back. Don't worry. <laughs> it's worth highlighting <laughs> that on the games, so on the most recent games, I've started introducing support for the uh, game controllers, because that's something I meant to do for a while. But uh, by the time I'd done Mutant Penguin, which has always been free, by the way... Um, oh, right, so this one has always been... Correct. Okay. Because it's a single-screen game, I, and because the original Mutant Penguin was free, it felt it was appropriate to, re to release this as a free title. But it comes with um, the standard Acorn keys, if we call them that, arrow keys, and the WASD keys. So the people were asking for things they were familiar with, so I always... Now this is written with the first game I wrote with my development kit, which I, which I, which I made available to make so my, my proof point for it. So this is um, basically uh, like Pengo, similar to, but not the same. So you slide the blocks along, it contains sound effects, which I presume are playing. But I can't yes, we are, get, we are getting a sound effect. Oh beat, good, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you can squash, the idea is to squash these um, slug type creatures uh, with the blocks. And then you progress, and if you touch the block, the characters, then you die. Um, so what I did, when I brought the graphics across from the Amiga, they were only in 320 by 256 resolution. So what you can do is you can upscale graphics, and it, you can calculate and interpolate the missing pixels. And that's what I've done here. I've just used that using an office shelf package, basically. But I have released, as a part of Drag and Drop, an article that explains how you can do this yourself which is sometimes quite helpful in updating old software. Absolutely. So how many levels are in this particular game? I think there are 10 on here. OK. Um, in this particular instance. And on average, how long did this actually take you to develop? I know you had assets that came from elsewhere, but on average, how long would it take? So it, it, it's, I'll tell you, I want to give you an idea. I, I, once I wrote Mutant Penguin, I wrote another game called Cyborg, which is uh, based on Cybertron Mission, which is an old BBC micro game. Cy Cyborg took two days to write. And this took maybe a, a couple of weeks because I was developing the game library at the same time. Okay. So I was using this as a proof point because underneath here, um, rather than just having um, a collection of procedures like I had with Overlord, I had a separate, three separate library files and I had put much more logic into them to make the game much simpler. So um, the most recent release I've done on this show, which we'll come to in a bit, uh, only took about two days to code and it just took longer to come up with the graphics and the concept, maybe about two months or so. So it varies from, from months to start uh, to uh, the first person shooters in more than a year. For example, but because of the 3D engine, that was a new thing. So I had to are write. the 3D games, I'm guessing, are obviously more complicated to do than the 2D. Is that was that be a fair maybe, assumption? It, I think so, but possibly now it's become easier because I've got something to work from. So Starmine took maybe a couple of months, um, and the next one might take less time than that. The reason is, is once you've solved the problem, you don't need to solve it again. 
effectively. You've got the piece of source code that you can reuse. Correct. And all the, uh, the library functions and the logic. Exactly. You know the kind of problems you're going to run into. But 3D is more complicated because, for example, in the 2D game, you can just go into the wall a little bit with the character. In a 3D game, that doesn't work that well. You can't see where you're going. Yeah. Things yeah. like that you have to think about. Okay. Um, before we have a look at your latest project, which is... Is it still in a beta mode at the moment? No, it will, or, it, it, where are we with that? So as a, there is a release today. There are some minor things to iron out or improvements I can make, but it's very playable. Um, a beta, the beta testers came back and said we didn't find any significant issues. But it's pretty new. I, I normally do an update shortly after the show to iron out anything, any minor points. But no, it's, it's sort of an initial release stage, shall we call it that. Release Canada 1. So what would you say to anybody thinking about becoming a developer for the Vesquez platform? What, what would you say to them to encourage them? Well, um, I would say uh, what, what you should do, one would consider looking at the development kit that I've got, the reason why it has things like um, error handling that pops up and it makes it slightly easier um, to, to solve, to manage certain things you don't have to concern yourself with. You see, if you, you've got, what you need to do is keep things very simple, don't try and be over ambitious, always develop things as small increments so you deliver something yeah. useful. Um, in the case of Risk OS, what's fun with it about it is it's very interactive, it's very transparent, it's very sort of uh, straightforward in many ways when you get used to it. It's kind of fun. But things like where something's been designed to make it easier to write things, it's worth considering looking at it. Now you mentioned the development kit. We'll give you a plug for the website right now. So if you're interested in seeing any of what Andy's been talking about or any of the other AMCOG products that are available, you can go to www.amcog-games.co.uk. Okay, shall we have a look at the latest game, which sure. I remember what it's called? Scuba Hunter. Scuba Hunter, okay. So this is basically um, uh, sort of my take on the Boulder Dash paradigm or Raptor type paradigm, except that I've set it underwater because I like to be a bit different. Um, and because of that, you'll see things in the sideways view. So if we start that, it comes with 10 levels. You can define your own keys if you want to. Or you can also use a joystick as well. So okay. We'll, so we'll go and use the preset keys. You've got, um, yeah, you can access the levels directly. So just to be clear, this is released, it's available today from the show, is that correct? Correct. And I will be uploading um, an updated version to the Play Store very soon, which has had minor improvements and things that you know, people have told me by playing it today. I think would be a good idea. And for those who have purchased it, will you be offering the updates? It's, well, all my updates are always free. And if, for example, the product you showed initially, it has a code in there that people can use to download things. Yeah, we won't talk about that again. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't worry. I, I should have warned you. Um, so you can collect these diamonds here. Now, the way I made a dive is worth noting. I found a diving instruction video on how to swim, and I drew over the top with a digital pen. Oh, right. And okay. then coloured it all in. So it's not exactly like this person. The same with the shark, actually. That's actually based on a, a real shark. They're quite aggressive, these characters. I think I'll run away from them. And this is based BBC Basic again? Correct. Okay. So this is using the game development uh, the game kit behind it. Um, you have to perform things in a certain order. So I went down there first, otherwise this rock would have dropped down and would have blocked it, you see. And it's that type of puzzle that you're dealing with. So for those who remember Repton on the BBC Micro, it's very much in that vein. Correct. Um, there are some differences, the diamonds fall, example, because this is a sideways view, rather than it being like a sort of hill, which I think that one was. And I can kill the, uh, the shark, hopefully, um, by using these rocks here. Oh, uh, right, okay. So he's now blown up. Um, ah, if you're not careful, ah, I've, ma I've managed to make the game unsolvable. <laughs> so you can kill yourself, that isn't going to help you this time. Um, but yes, that was always the problem, wasn't it? It's worth yeah. demonstrating that, uh, well, this is the whole point, the game is designed like that. So, uh, so you ha things have to be done in a certain order. Yes. Of what, yeah. But okay. you don't have to do the whole game, the whole level in a certain order. Does it tell you if, if you've done something that now makes it, in, or do you kind of have to? Unfortunately, you have to find out. This ah. is like it was in Repton, yes. it's the same yeah. type of yeah. thing, really. But um, I, I always found that quite a fun type of uh, puzzle pattern. I thought it was quite interesting to incorporate that in here rather than just being, you know, shoot all the monsters or just collect all the objects. 
Absolutely. I mean, you've got to. Really the animation you've got there is. Is, 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 is that just sprites tiling on top of each other? Or? So this this is done. So GameKit works with a implements a tile library, uh, and yes, I've got a power, I've got an image behind that animates at a different uh, offset, so creating a, like a two level effect. Here's an example of one of those puzzles that you can get caught out with. You have to get those diamonds first before you release these boulders. You see. I need to make the boulders fall off each other, really. But there you are, that's, um, yeah, that's the basic premise of the game, I think. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that Pleasure. with us here today. A reminder then, if you're interested in Anthony's games, and you've got, how many titles is it now? Uh, Can you remember? <laughs> well, I, I think this might be the 10th or 11th game. 10th or 11th game. And there are, on my stands now, I'm selling about 20 different things, including music, etc. Well worth a look. Again, the web address is www.amcoggames.co.uk. Anthony, thank you very much for your time. You're watching Wi-Fi Sheet. We are live here in Bristol. There's plenty more coming up. Do stay with us. Now, this wasn't part of the schedule, but I'm really pleased and privileged that we've been joined by Richard Brown from Risk Arrest Developments Limited. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Now, just explain to everyone a little bit about what's going on with the new Risk Arrest Direct initiative and OS that has launched today. Right. Well, some people may have heard of Risk OS themselves. Uh, some people will not know it at all, but it's a good, compact, risk operating system. You've spoken about it on your Wi-Fi sheet channel and you and I got talking uh, back in the summer last year. We most certainly did, yeah. About <laughs> how to get more people maybe involved with it just so that they could see it. And we came up with this joint plan where you're going to do some brilliant videos. I believe the first one has already been streamed out. Absolutely, the now. first one the first one, if you want to watch the first video of Risk Arrest Direct, it is now live on demand on our channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Wi-Fi sheet. And it's not just a video series, though, because we're following up with an actual Raspberry Pi operating system. That's right. Risk Arrest, Risk Arrest Direct, as we've called it, uh, is the Risk OS slightly reskinned so that when Tom is talking about this and demonstrating it, as I've seen him do on that first episode, you know, click here, do this, and he's going to take you through the steps uh, so that instead of having to pick up a, a manual, which I know a lot of people these days, uh, why do I have to look through a manual? Much better to uh, go on YouTube, see how it's done. So this is aimed specifically at this build that we've put together, and it will be available from the Risk Cost Developments uh, website. In fact, we can actually just have a quick look at the desktop. We were using it to demonstrate... Uh, with Anthony Barcher from Amcog Games. So lots of things going on here with the desktop itself. Uh, this folder in particular is just the one we've had set up for live, but what I'm really impressed about is just the amount of software that's now been added to this distribution. Some of it we're gonna go through very shortly, but it's really, really impressive. So we've got everything from games to, probably my favorite actually is the programming folder. And again, we'll be doing some more on this later on on the channel. So, for example, we've got Python for, is this the first time with an official Python build to be bundled with Risk? I think it is. It's the first one that's been bundled with uh, well, the Risk yes. OS build, yes. And it's not just Python 2, it's Python 2 and Python 3, because anyone who knows about Python will know that the syntax between the two changed, which meant that your Python 2 software wasn't compatible with your Python 3 software and vice versa. So, hence, we've got both versions, so we can actually bring... Python code over to RiskOS for the very first time. So it's just all stuff like that's really, really exciting. You are very excited. I am very, I, I'm very I might be excited or tired, it's one of the two. <laughs> so where, where do we go from here? What's, what's 2020 gonna hold? Well, there will most probably be more updated builds of RiskOS 
there are features in there that are being worked on. Uh, we need improvement in certain areas. Tom will touch upon those uh, in some of the yeah, episodes as they come out. But uh, we've been really pleased with the response from the people that write programs and look after them. I had an email only late last week from one particular gentleman who's got a whole slew of games. And we're allowed to have all of them for free. So we will be doing a game software bundle pack within months. Uh, we'll put it all together, we'll check them, and then we will make it available for free to everyone Which that wants it. Absolutely superb. And if you stay with us here on the live stream, we're gonna be go through some of the games that are already come with the Riskrest Direct build, and we'll be doing that in a few moments' time. For now, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Richard Brown there from Riskrest Developments Limited. This is Wi-Fi Sheep live from the Southwest Computer Show in Bristol. We're going to take a short break. Do stay with us. Now I thought we'd take this opportunity to have a look at some of the gaming and retro emulators available and built into the new build of RiskRest Direct for the Raspberry Pi. So we've got the main RiskRest Direct desktop. Now if you've been watching us earlier on in the day you'll have seen this in use with a couple of demonstrations. And most of the times you'll be clicking the SD card which acts a bit like your hard drive or C drive on a PC. So one click down there and we have a folder called Diversions. Earlier on we showed Overlord and M Penguin, which are games developed by Anthony Bartram of Amcog Games, but there are other things on the system. So for example Minehunt, which is your classic Minesweeper PC game that anyone who used any version of Windows, especially during the 90s, early 2000s, will remember possibly at school being bored and playing that. Uh, Meteors, which is a clone, basically, of Meteors, which is pretty self-explanatory. But we also have some new additions. And one of those is actually a port of the 1993 PC classic, Doom. So if we double click the app, or the pling, it's denoted by an explanation mark at the front of the title, so that's how you know these are apps. And you'll see that the Doom icon actually loads down here, so we're gonna click once, and it will load straight in. This is a direct port of the PC version, and it uses the free to use shareware edition and map. So let's go new game, and I'm gonna set it very easy. Okay, so I'm controlling with the mouse, and if I click, and you can see it's running really, really smoothly. We're actually using a Raspberry Pi 3 for this, but this will run just as well right back to an original Raspberry Pi, no problem at all, no frame drop anywhere. So we can, if we middle click, we can open doors. I'll apologise in advance if anyone gets motion sickness. If you do buy the um, WAD or WAD files, you can actually still buy uh, commercially for Doom. You can expand the gameplay and have the different levels and chapters. But we've managed to include the free one here with the RiskOS Direct distro. And that should be the exit gate. There we go. And level complete. And it works as good as that. So we'll just quit out of that one now. So yes, just quit. So that is Doom. Now, I have to remember a lot of risk OS apps, they will remain open. Doom is no exception. So we have to middle click and quit just to free up the memory that it would have used. 
Okay, let's move on and look at emulators. Now, this is something quite special for MuscoS, as we have the ability to run both Acorn 26-bit and Acorn 8-bit emulators and software. This is the sort of thing that's not available with other popular retro gaming distributions, such as RetroPie, for example, which doesn't support the BBC Micro or the Acorn Archimedes. Before we go any further, I'm going to now show you a little bit of video of how we went about downloading a new game or vintage app for the system. In this video, we grabbed a copy of the classic space game Elite, and we downloaded a disc image for the BBC Micro and one for the Acorn Archimedes. Unfortunately, we've not been able to get an internet connection directly to this desktop, so we can't do this bit live. So we'll now just segue into the piece of video that was shot the other day. So we'll start at the main Miscrest Direct desktop. And the first thing we want to do is go to NetSurf. And this will open up down here. So we'll just left click and we get NetSurf homepage. I'm going to use the Google search box and I'm going to search for Elite and Ian Bell. And we'll click search. First result that comes up is Ian Bell's Elite Pages. And on his site, let's just uh, maximize that up. There we go. And on his site, he has published elites here. BBC elites. And we've got here the elite disc images. Here's the original disc image. So what we're going to do is if we hit circle to minimize our web browser, we'll now click the SD card. We're going to open our emulators and we've got Acorn 8-bit. And we're going to leave this window open here. Let's go back and let's click to download the Elite Disk image, which will create this folder. Now we click, drag, and we'll drop. And there is the Elite image. OK, we'll go back. Now the next one we're going to look at is for Acorn Archimedes, which is here. And here is the link for the downloading the Arc. So if we now right click close, we go back to the parent directory and we have Acorn 26 bits. So what we'll do is we'll just drop that download in here. So we'll click and we can drag like so. Okay, so that shows you how to go about using the NetSurf web browser to download, find and download uh, ViscoS software and BBC Micro disk images. So let's go back to our desktop live. Okay, so we'll start with the 8 bit, and Acorn 8 bit is covered by a program called Bbit. If I double click Bbit, it will load down here like what you saw with Doom. If I click, we will get a BBC Micro interpreter. There we go. Uh, now, you'll notice that it looks a little bit skew if it's stretched. This is a common problem depending on how your uh, video capture is set up. And because we're running our Pi system for a video capture card, it can sometimes play a little bit havoc with a few things. Not to worry. Let's press F12 on the keyboard. If I middle click Model B icon, let's have a quick look under Options. And there's a tab here for Display Mode. If I ask it high, save and set. Now, if I click back, you'll notice the thing is now in the correct aspect ratio. Now, this is basically a full functioning BBC micro, so it will now be able to understand and run all your BBC Basic and 6502 software from the 1980s period. If we want to load up our disk image, let's find our folder that we dumped which is here this is a zip now we have a program called SparkFS that can actually unzip things just by double clicking and we have a slash SDD 
disk image here. Now, SDD or dot .SDD is the uh, single density disk, is what it stands for. And that's basically a flashed image of floppy disk containing the software. So what we'll do is we'll just click and we'll drag to get this outside of the zip. Now it comes across as data. We need to change the file type so Bbit can understand. If we middle click the icon, go to file, and then there's an option to set type. And you see at the moment it says data. So I'm going to change that to DFS image, all one word. Now notice how the icon has now changed to a five and a quarter inch floppy disk. If I now click and drag this icon on top of the Model B down here, you'll notice we launch back into Bbit and the BBC Micro. Now if I go shift and break, now on a modern keyboard your break key is sometimes called pause, so it's shift and pause or shift and break. It will now actually load up the disk image just like it would do on an original micro. And there we are, that is the original build of Elite. I'm going to hit no. So we can launch now on the BBC Micro to launch a ship. It was normally F0. The observant amongst you, if you look down at your keyboard in front of you, assuming you're watching us on a computer, you'll notice you probably don't have an F0 key. Do not fear, it is F10. And F10 again. And that will also work just as well. Now, can I remember how this works? It's keyboard driven, of course, so it's S and X go up and down. And I'm trying to remember my left and right. There we go. And it's the bracket keys left and right. Again, it's a good example of uh, getting you uh, motion sickness again. A is shoots, there we are. And there is the whole game. And then when we're done, we can hit F12, middle click, and we can quit. So that's how you would load a BBC Micro ROM or disk image into Risk Arrest Direct. Let's have a look at something a little bit more complicated, and that's Acorn 26 bit. This is basically software for the Acorn Archimedes range of computers. And there was the file that we dumped. So let's just double click that again. And this time we have Elite. This is the slightly later version of Elite for the Acorn Archimedes. And this is a Acorn disk image. So slightly different to BBC Micro 1. Again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to click, drag and drop. Now you'll notice this folder here. Now this is a strange one because it has a pling uh, explanation mark, meaning it's an app of sorts, but it's also a folder at the same time. If I double click it, there's a nest of icons and a boot directory inside. I'm going to hold down the shift key because I need to move this icon. If you don't and you just click and drag, you'll make a copy to a new folder. So I'm going to hold down shift, click, drag and drop. Now, we're going to try and change this file format. Let's see what it is at the moment. Again, it's data. That's no good to us. And we're simply going to change this to floppy. And you notice it changes to a slightly different type of floppy disk icon. Now, this is a risk arrest program, but it's an original risk arrest program. It's not directly compatible with risk arrest direct. That's because risk arrest direct running on the Raspberry Pi is a 32-bit operating system, whereas the original Acorn Archimedes rather was a 26-bit system. How do we get around this? Well, Risk Rest Direct comes complete and shipped with Risk Rest 3.11 ROM. If I double click on Acorn mode, excuse me a minute, I just need a drink of water. There we go. You'll see it now boots a completely separate Archimedes risk rest free operating system so we have a different environment and space all those apps and icons you saw in that folder have now appeared here as the host fs directory and there is our elite floppy 
If I go into apps here, there's this program, ADFFS. I'll double click that, it loads a folder down here. Now watch what happens if I click, drag and drop. It actually opens up the floppy disk and there is Elite. So we should be able to double click that. And just like it did in Riskrest Direct, Riskrest Free loads the icon down here. Let's click. And you can see the difference in just a few years between the BBC Micro version and the slightly later Acorn Archimedes. We actually have a mouse this time, so there's no F0 needed. We can just click Launch. And this is now mouse controlled. And if I click, that shoots. And one thing I always do, I never play Elite properly, is if you attack the space station like that, you'll attract a lot of ships will start coming out of it and you'll get into a uh, dogfight in space sometimes. Let's just turn our power down a little bit. Sometimes. Of course, uh, you know, law of averages, as soon as I'm live streaming to you, it's uh, decided, no, that's fine, we're not going to do anything. Oh no, here we go. I think I've got, oh, there we are, Sungish just come up, Space Station, where are you? Like, oh. More training in Elite needed, I think, but you get the idea. So this is now running perfectly fine, and you can do this with a whole host of Archimedes software. Let's hit F12. We'll quit. Yeah, we'll quit to come out of that. There we go. Now, those were programs that we added, but RiskOS Direct comes with some vintage games already preloaded here into the 3.11 ROM. So, if I click Games, these are the games. These come pre installed with the OS now, they're included. Uh, and some of my personal favourites, like Cannon Fodder. These were when Acorn still got AAA developers, so Cannon Fodder was across all sorts of different platforms. And this is the little known Acorn Archimedes build. Again, you'd struggle to emulate this using Linux on RetroPie. And that's one of the beauties of having RiskOS Direct set up the way it is. Okay, what have we got then? And it's one of those sort of slightly quirky click and point shooters. It's a lot of fun. So there's the enemy, and there we go. So it's a bit of a sort of a tactical click and point. <laughs> there we are, mission complete. Of course, that's just the first level and control escape or quit an application. If it's not obvious how to quit something, hold down control and escape and you can quit it like so. There's lots of other games in there. We won't go into too much of that now. But I'll leave those for you to explore in your own time. When you're done, there's a shutdown option here and this won't shut down the whole system. It'll just turn off the 3.11 ROM. So if I double click and click again, you see we instantly return to Riskrest Direct and our modern desktop environment. We'll quickly have a look at um, DOS and PC for you. So this is a version of DOSBox, which will give you compatibility for a huge percentage of x86 PC and IBM compatible applications. Stuff probably up to around the Windows 3.195 era. It doesn't come with a copy of Windows. I do have a uh, copy of Windows actually loaded. 
So we have a, a virtual C drive now, and if I type uh, CD Windows Win, it will actually load up, in this case, Windows 3.1. And it's a very usable operating system that you can have inside the space of your SQS desktop, which is extremely useful if you've got legacy applications that you need to run or old files you need to open. You can do it all through the emulator in a very, very fast pace here on the SQS desktop. We'll just close that for now. Yes, so back under diversions, we have Scum VM, which I'm going to double click. Now, Scum VM, we featured it, I believe, briefly on Wi-Fi Sheep channel itself. It's kind of an emulator and kind of isn't. It's a sort of a front end that allows a lot of selective PC games and multimedia software to actually work on systems it was never intended for by putting in and recreating the resources needed for the master files to run. So it's not strictly speaking an emulator, but it works pretty much in that fashion. So I've got Scum VM here loaded, and what I want to do is I want to put a PC game and get it running here on Misco S. Okay, so before we went live, I had a PC copy of Mist, which is the classic uh, 3D adventure click and point and click game from Sound Worlds, released I think 1993 from memory. I have a PC Windows version of that, the Masterpiece Edition. And what you can do is you can take that disk, you can just put it in a PC and copy all the content of the disk. So it's not copying the disk, it's just copying the folders. And I put it on a USB stick and I put it into a folder called Mist, which is here. And these are all the resources, including the .exes, which of course are all compiled for Windows, so are not going to work on RiskOS. But here is all the data that makes Mist work. Now, if I go to ScumVM, no, I click Add Game, sorry. I beg your pardon. So if we go to Mist folder and we click choose, there we go. It tries to identify what it is and it has it on the list as Mist Masterpiece Edition Windows. So we'll click choose. That's fine. We'll say. Just to check, uh, yeah, we'll go with that for now. So we'll say OK. Now if I click start. you'll see it actually will now launch Mist. Frame rate on um, movies and video can be a little bit sketchy sometimes. So there we go, Cyan Worlds of course. And this runs really, really well considering this is not meant to run A on the Raspberry Pi, B on an ARM processor, which is what powers the Raspberry Pi, and C definitely not meant to be running on Risk OS. But here it is. And it runs really well. And it's the full game. So you can add, if you've got software that ScumVM can actually run, and a lot of the point and click adventure games and some of the LucasArts. Uh, PC DOS era stuff from the kind of early to mid 90s is compatible and you could actually bring it over and run it here on RiskOS Direct. So there's been a brief overview of gaming on RiskOS Direct and some of the brilliant software and emulators available. We really hope you're going to like that part. So if you're looking for something a little bit different for retro gaming that's not covered by RetroPie, the more popular Linux based distributions for Raspberry Pi, then really seriously do come and have a look at RiskOS Direct. I'm very pleased to say we're joined by another guest, a long-term friend of the channel. Welcome to Wi-Fi Live, to Rob Common. Rob, hi, how hi, are you Tom. doing? 
long day, hasn't it? You've been now. You've been exhibiting. You've been over there in the second hall. Uh -huh. We haven't been able to show people that today, unfortunately. But you've been very busy. Yeah. So a few of us from the mini startup forum have had um, some eight-bit machines set up. Um, so I've been showing a BBC Master, uh, mainly running my um, high emulators, uh, so the Amstrad and the ZX Spectrum, and uh, had a BBC B running my Doom port. And then uh, Chris Morley was also on the startup forum has been showing his bad apple demo. So yeah, well we'll come back to the um, Doom port in a bit, but I think a lot of people, especially my flashlight, will probably know you as the inventor and the creator of the video NULA graphics card for the BBC Micro. Now we've got here a little bit of footage that we're just going to play over the top of my attempts at putting video NULA together. Multiple videos, subscribers to the channel will know. Just tell us a little bit about that project, what exactly it is and how it came about. Yeah, so um, when I got back into BBC Micro in about 2005, um, I got given a load of old Acorn user magazines and just thumbing through them one night I came across an advert for um, something called a palette mate created by a company called Wild Vision. So this is about 1986 and I have to be honest, although I, I was quite into BBC Micros at the time, it wasn't something I was aware of. Um, and that gave uh, a palette of 4096 colours and um, a full 16 colour mode rather than the BBC Micros traditional 8 colours plus 8 flashing. Um, and so subsequently I, I kind of looked for one of these, I, I, I was sort of really intrigued by it and so sort of searched eBay, um, got to various people, I even contacted Pete Wilde who was the managing director of Wild Vision or attempted to contact him um, to see just to find more about it really um, and eventually because it drew a blank I decided to bite the bullet and remake it myself so that's how the Virginia LA was born. Um, it started out as just me trying to learn a bit of HDL and knocking together on a prototype sort of circuit board, um, which I think I showed at um, the Risk OS Wakefield show um, back in 2017, maybe 2016. Um, and uh, a few people sort of said, Oh, I really like that, where can I buy one? And I was a bit like, well, just I was one of those people, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you were very encouraging, as, as was the sort of friend, because there were a number of other people. Um, and so I turned it into a sort of proper sort of PCB design and um, started making them and sort of selling them on Stardot and a bit on eBay as well. And kind of, it's kind of grown from there. So I added various capabilities like um, smooth scrolling and a, a spectrum, ZX spectrum mode, um, which allowed me to sort of then emulate the ZX spectrum. This is a, quite a feature for the BBC Micro to be able to, it needs a Raspberry Pi board additionally to the original hardware. So combination of your card, the Raspberry Pi Pi Tube Direct module, yes. two of them together, and it can run, do you say ZX Spectrum yeah. software? So, so I have to, so, so an admission for me, the BBC wasn't my first love, but it was my first computer. Um, my first one was a ZX81. Um, and so when I got a Pi Tube Direct, um, even though I hadn't touched the ZX81 since I got my BBC Micro in 1983, um, I was interested in kind of exploring that again. I had not sort of played one under emulation, so I wrote the ZX81 emulator. And for those who know the ZX81, it's got a very simple character-based display, so it was very easy to, to sort of um, write a C program running on the Pi, and then just uh, push the character display across the two port on the BBC Micro to display the ZX81's graphics. Um, and so that, that took me probably like, I don't know, a couple of days or so, and I put on the startup forum and someone said, oh, you should do a Spectrum emulator, you should call it Spectrum, because the BBC Micro has lots of ROMs on yes. um, And I thought, yeah, but the problem with that is that the B can't do the Spectrum's attribute graphics mode, and I suddenly thought, well, Video New LA could, so I enhanced Video New LA to add that in, and then brought the Z80 um, emulator to run on the Pi, and then just push the graphics across the T port. So I appreciate you can't see what we're seeing on screen at the moment, but uh, we're actually showing how I created a, a custom palette. Oh, so yes. if you have an existing BBC Micro game, and let's be honest, some of them great gameplay, gory colours, <laughs> yes. you can actually on the fly, without having to change any code, remix yeah. the colour palette. So Is that just correct? With, yeah, that's right. So the Virginia LA, effectively, um, as far as software is concerned, it doesn't know it exists. 
and what it does is it, it translates the output from the BBC Micro, um, so the colours come out of it, into an analogue palette. So it remaps those colours. Um, and it, so software isn't aware this is happening, so it's compatible with all the original software, all the games they used to play. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, as you say, aware that lots of BBC Micro games are quite garish palettes. You can change them and the software will run. We're just looking at SimCity right oh, here, which was a classic one, and I, it's bright red background <laughs> and yellow roads, and I have it here with green uh, landscapes and grey. Because, yeah. of course, you can have greys and all yeah, sorts of colours you can never have originally. And I was showing someone earlier a fire truck, which is one of my favourite big games, um, which the original level is like blue and magenta and looks hideous, but I, it's, it's kind of like it's supposed to be in space, so I have it set as two levels of grey and it looks far more like a sort of moon or lunar landscape then. OK, let's talk about Doom. You have created a way to get Doom, and we showed the 1993 port of Doom, which now comes as part of Viscous Direct running on the Pi. You have it running on the BBC Micro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah How? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so back, I guess, um, last year, maybe, yeah, um, someone on the startup forum said, oh, we've got all these new upgrades for the BBC Micro, the Pi 2 Direct, Video New LA, Mass Storage. Could, how do we push this to the limits? Couldn't we get Doom running? And I think various people said, oh, well, they're, they're Doom ports for kind of like the Spectrum 1 to 8, I think, and we could take the Z80 Pro process on that. And I just said, hang on, I think there's a much simpler way. If you take the SDL Doom source code which for Linux, it's C code, you, you know, I've written C code with my emulators for the Pi, it's very easy to compile, why don't we just try compiling that and see how much it works? So I did, and about 95% of the source files compiled straight away. The only bits that don't compile are the SDL routines that handle the graphics. Now the SD, that's the graphics, the graphics video right. front end. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. yeah. So it's the, um, the stuff that does the video, the stuff that does the keyboard handling, the stuff that does the sound. Um, there's some the stuff in that does networking, um, which we come back to. Um, so I, I essentially just ripped all that out and replaced it with my own routines that send the video data across the Pi, no, to, 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 from the Pi, across the tube port to the Beeb. Um, now that's done in a, in a quite sophisticated way, or at least in, a, in a, an efficient way, so that it renders at a reasonable rate, I think it renders something, something like 13 frames a second, which if you look at some of the Doom ports and things like the Amiga, you know, that's comparable, roughly comparable with some of the models at least. Um, and it's smooth enough because the, the, the play area is double buffered that, um, you know, it, it gives you a reasonable experience. The resolution's halved and... I was going to ask about yeah. what, for those who know the BBC Micro, what screen mode is this actually running in, technically? So, so, so it runs in a couple of modes. It can either run in mode 2, if you've got a Vision ULA, it can then use the full 16 colours and the 4096 colour palette, so you get a, quite a, you know, a reasonable representation of the play area. But rather than being 320 pixels wide, it's only 160. So I think that's what we're looking at here on the video, yes, okay. the gameplay, so yeah. So you'll notice the resolution's halved, but you've got a reasonable colour depth um, and a reasonable choice of colours. There is another one, for those who don't have a Vision ULA, you can run it um, in the original mode 1, which was 30, uh, 320 pixels wide, but that's only four colours, so I then do use dithering to... Oh right, so you've actually got a port of this that just uses the Pi module, it doesn't yes. actually need the... Yes, that's right. Um, you, so you can run it with just in the four colour mode, um, with dithering, and, and that, to be honest, that looks fairly reasonable, because you've got the increased resolution, um, although you haven't got the colour depth, it's still playable. Um, you do need some form of mass storage because some of the walls are like megabytes in size, so they're never going to fit on a big floppy. I was going to ask about that. So, what would you kind of recommend as mass storage? Because right. there's so many yeah. options out there. So there are now. So I mean, you've got lots of choices. So I have on my BBCB, I have a Go SDC, which um, has a hard drive image on it. Um, on my BBC Master, which I've got here today, I've got a data center. Again, that has an ADFS hard drive using a compact flash card. Um, but there are there are other solutions. The um, the popular sort of SD card interfaces, I think some builds of the firmware now allow you to have a hard drive image on them. Okay. Um, and there's also, um, on the start off forum, there's been a, um, a 1 megahertz Buster Pi interface, which is really exciting. Um, and that allows you to plug a Raspberry Pi into the 1 megahertz bus on the Beeb, use that as mass storage, and you also get another, a number of other peripherals that are emulated as well, like the Music 5000, um, a RAM disk. I think they're building other stuff for it as well. So 
you know, that's a really good solution. I think that there's, a, there's recently been a build of these boards on, or the interface boards on Stardot. I, I'd, I'd certainly recommend looking at those. There's also things like Beep SCSI, which again works really well, it's very fast. So, I mean, this is all relatively recent development. Yeah, the last sort couple of years, yeah. I mean, how do you think the sort of scene has grown, especially with the interest in retro and 8-bit, it seems to be bigger than ever. In relation to the beat, how do you feel it's kind of progressed in recent years? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you look at the number of people on Stardot, on the Facebook group, you know, um, the interest is incredible. And, and even if you just look on eBay, the prices that sort of second-hand beeps go for now, it's really taken off. When I got back into beeps in 2005, I paid a five off a couple of these in micros, and you yeah, yeah. a few hundred now. For, Easily, know, yes. The bundle I got. Um, so in some ways, you know, that's great. You know, it's great to see people are interested and keen to get hold of this stuff. Um, obviously, for, for people coming into it, it's perhaps the price is a little prohibitive, but there are always things like emulators. Um, but it's just the number of sort of harder developments really excites me. You know, that, as I say, if, if you told me when I was, you know, a teenager, you know, being sort of younger than that, that, you know, you'd start BBC and people would still be doing stuff for them in 2020, you know, I really do think you, know, you had a, the Python Direct, you had a hard drive, the machine's transformed. You know, you've got, Absolutely, you've got yeah. serious processing power, you can use high level modern languages, and you've got the ability to sort of um, hold and load mass amounts of data. I mean, regular sort of Wi Fi Sheep Channel will know my own um, adventures with the BBC Micro. Some successful, some not, <laughs> and maybe I've had you know, a bit of help along the way. You know. <laughs> so thank you for that, Rob. You're welcome. Just going back to your Doom port, is it publicly available yet, or what, what, what's its status? Right, yeah, so, so I think various builds are out on the Stardot uh, forum. I haven't released it yet simply because it's not finished. Um, I want to get the sound working, at least to some extent. The sound is always the hardest bit with these things, even with the, sort of the Amstrad emulator, the Spectrum emulator. Sound is the hardest thing, really, um, because you've got to map the sound somehow to the beep sound system, which isn't the most flexible because it's you know, fairly high level. Um, I want to get sounded. The other thing I'm working on, and I was hoping to have done it for today, but time has uh, beaten me really, is to get networking going. Networking? So, I, yeah, someone's asked me whether we could do a, sort of a death match kind of across the network. Which uh, Doom was classic for on the PC. On the PC. So yeah. the idea would be, my, my master's got an Ethernet card in it, um, so the idea would be that we could play across the network um, against someone playing on an ARC or on a PC. Oh, so it could actually connect to other... Yeah, using si Ethernet, yeah. So not just beeps together. Not just beeps. Although I would like, given the ultimate aim, if I got on this road, it would be to get Econet to, you know, run across a, a number of beeps. Which was Acorn's like, internal networking Acorn's drivers, internal yeah. Acorn's internal networking solution. Um, that would be great. Um, but I started with Ethernet at the moment just because that's simpler than um, going straight to Econet. But again, that, that's kind of like a longer term goal. My first thing is to get sound working, and then once that's done, I'd like to release it. It'd be fantastic if you would. I'm sure a lot of people would very much enjoy playing Doom. I mean, we're just looking at the footage again here live, and yeah, I could see a lot of people just doing the upgrades to their veteran BBCs. Which <laughs> BBC models is it compatible with? Um, so, any that's got two port, so not, not the compact. Um, you, need, you need a PyTube Direct. Um, and you need some form of mass storage. Um, if you've got a video neural A, you get enhanced colours. If you haven't, you can use the dithered full colour version. But the more common model B and the master, model B, the master will work, work master fine. Master 1 to 8B plus, yeah. Everything pretty much apart from a compact. Well, Rob, thank you very much for joining us here today on Wi-Fi Sheep Live. A reminder that if you miss any of today's broadcast, you can watch it again on our YouTube channel, that's youtube.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep. Now, today has seen the launch of RiscOS Direct, a new video program that you've just seen on the channel, and also a standalone Raspberry Pi distribution, allowing for new users to hopefully pick up the RiscOS Acorn platform. On this new build, we have a number of programming tools and languages open to you, and that's what we're gonna look at now. So let's swap over to 
on our desktop. So this is what RiskRS Direct will look like when you get an SD card or the digital download. So on our main pinboard or desktop area, we actually have a folder called Programming, which you'll double click. And I'll just go through very quickly what is actually here. So for those of you that are familiar with code already, we do have a C compiler, which is the common GCC compiler. Uh, anyone who writes the very uh, various versions of C will be familiar with GCC, so that's included. We have PHP for anybody who does web development or web servers. That's a very common server-side language, and we have a stack available there. Risk Lua, which is a build of the Lua programming language, which I have to admit is a personal favourite of mine. Uh, that's also included. We do have BBC Basic, a modern version of the classic BBC Basic uh, that originally shipped with the BBC Micro. This is a 32-bit edition. We'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to show you Python. So, Risk Rest Direct comes shipped with Python 2 and Python 3. And if we double click, folders you can see here are the two Python interpreters. Uh, we also include Python 3 here on the pinboard. So if I just double click, it will open a new task window and there is the live Python 2. And we should now, fingers crossed, be able to do the same thing. Yes, we can. And there is Python 3. If I go control and F12, I ask for basic, I just type basic, there is BBC basic. So we've now got two Python interpreters and a basic interpreter open live and waiting for code. Now there are a few differences and this will change as the build progresses, but right now this is Python 2, so let's try putting some code in. So if I say print quote mark hello, press return or enter and you see we get hello and it reports back. However, if I try to do that in Python 3, so exactly the same thing again, it fails. This is the thing to remember that Python syntax changed between version 2 and version 3 which did render a lot of the version 2 code unusable or unreadable if you only had a version 3 interpreter. So to make this work, I'd actually have to put print, open a curly bracket, put my text in hello, close bracket, and now that actually works. BBC Basic, if we try that again, that will also fail and not be valid because BBC Basic is case sensitive. So the print command has to be in uppercase. So print, oops, let's spell that correctly. There we are. And there you are, see. So there's how three different interpreters work. Now there are other things we've got built in. So we'll see if this works. So Python 2 on Risk Rest Direct has Pygame. That's Pygame is in the gaming and vis visual desktop module that came included with the stock Raspbian and Raspberry Pi Linux builds. We've got a working copy of that here. So if I try and import the module, so I type import Pi game. Ah, now you notice how it says there's a slight error here. That's a known bug. It's an unfortunate bug, but it's a known bug in the system. We're working on it. So we'll just close that. No big deal. Open up another one. Let's just try that again. And there you go, second time it loads in. So it says hello from Pygame community. So we know that's now working. Okay, so we've got these interpreters and we'll close those. Say, so, yep, we're done. Now what I have got is some code, which I have in our live folder. So this is Python code. What we now have is we've got a Python 3 file and a Python 2. And if we middle click and look at the file type, Python 2s can simply be called Python, and that is the file type. Python 3 files, 
need to have the free. And what we can do is, let's say we want to open his heads and tails uh, code. Now this has come from Keris Lock of the Stafford Raspberry Pi Jam, and at the end of each Pi Jam event, it's, it's mainly for kids, they have a sort of like a raffle heads and tails game, a kind of party game if you remember from a kid, and they actually give away prizes, sometimes whole Raspberry Pis as a result, and they have this piece of code which they normally run on Raspbian. Now if I hold down shift key and double click, we can have a look at the code. So this is Python 3 and we're importing the random module and the random module is used to generate random numbers because that's not stock to Python and you see HT equals then we create a list so heads or tails and then we print random choice HT. So if I double click it generates a task window that says heads if I double click again, heads again, heads again, come on give us a tail. Heads of <laughs> come on give us a tail. Hey there we go, there's a tail, it does work. You see how simple it is to just load Python, there's no having to go through an interpreter, there's no having to click um, run or whatever that you normally have to do on Raspbian, it will just work. Now, the Python 2 I want to show you has Pygame. I can't remember if I mentioned that Python 2 on this is the only one that has the Pygame module installed. It's not available in Python 3 just yet. Uh, again, it will be a work in progress. Let's just have a quick look at the source code for that. It's a little more complicated. So you can see we import Pygame. And then we set up some parameters or variables, so background color, height and width, screen, and then we're going to call pygame.display, and that's a module that comes over from importing pygame, like so. Now, hopefully, if I double click this, there we go, it actually generates a window in request. It will do exactly the same thing if you run this on Linux, Mac OS, or Windows, it's now got that level of compatibility. So what we could do is we could, for example, do change the background color here. So I've got it purple. So let's go 255, middle click, and we need to save. So we've now got 255, 255, 255. These are the R, G, and B, red, green, and blue values of the background color. So if I reload, you can see it's now white and if I take green and blue to zero and leave red at 255 again remember to save and let's reload we now get the solid red so you can see how you can use these values to mix colors and create backgrounds this is a very simple tutorial but you see how we can create an application or game even and we can actually Delete graphics within Windows and it all works within Risk OS. And again, this code would be virtually fully compatible with other OSs. Okay, let's have a look at BASIC. This is the more classic BBC BASIC, which I'm sure um, older audience members are probably more familiar with. Now we have BASIC app here on the desktop. This is one of my own creations and a simple double click will launch the basic interpreter and it switches into full screen mode and in mode 7 which is the classic BBC Micro booting mode. So this is full BBC basic so all your BBC basic commands remembering to put caps lock on will work. If you don't have caps lock and you try it will fail and we can actually switch modes on the fly. So there's mode 2, mode 1 mode zero and when we're done we can just type quit and we come back to the desktop so what you can do is you can create a simple game and I have a game I've been working on here space shoot slash bass bass is the file extension for basic and if we look at the file structure here set type it's basic we double click it will load oops 
I can remember what my keys were for this now. Oh, it's arrows. There we go. So arrow keys back and forth, spacebar shoots, and it's a sort of classic, quick Space Invaders. I held down shift, I can double click, and we'll have a look, oops, at the source code. We don't want to do that, there we go. And you'll notice that there's no line numbers. With modern basic, indeed with modern Python, you don't need to include line numbers if you're not referencing a line. So for basic, for example, there was the classic go to 10. Uh, in fact, we can do that now. Let's do that code now and I'll show you. So let's clear the screen. So 10 print i 20 go to 10. Oops, 30. You don't actually need to put end because you never get to line 30, but we'll put it in anyway. If I run, there you go, and then we can hit escape when we're done. Now we have a program here called Strong Ed, which if I double click and we click again down here, it brings up, it looks like a text editor, and that's effectively what it is. But it has something called base mode. So if I middle click and then change mode, you see all the different languages I can code, and that includes basic. So, now before the problem was that if I, get, if I put the command, let's make sure we've got uppercase on, if I go, go to 10 for example, it needs a line number to actually reference, but we don't actually have to have line numbers. So we could theoretically go to CLS to clear the screen and we'll say always allow that action. Clear the screen. Repeat. Print high. Notice how it already indents for you. In basic, you don't have to have indenting. It just does it to clean it up. It's not like Python where if you don't have the correct indenting, the program fails. Basic is very happy. You can have as many spaces in there as you want. It normally doesn't have a problem. So. We've asked it to print high, and we'll say until false. And you see how that now goes back on the next line. So you can see where the repeat starts, what we're going to do, and until it's false. So if we click the running man icon, let's see what happens. And there we go. So it's actually brought up a window and it's looping. Because we didn't declare a screen mode, it's just looping in a window within the RiskOS environment. If I hit escape, it escapes, and that brings us back. So if I go CLS, and let's try mode, let's try mode seven. So I actually have a series of programs. What have we got? Probably not in that folder. There we go. And this is a series of basic stuff which I've written before. So we could try my, my 3D engine. And this is all basic and this basically generates. A 3D cube. It's quite simple. It's not brilliant. There's better demonstrations of 3D coding than this, but it's something I've done. And if we wanted to have a look at that code, we shift double click and you can actually see how the code works. And again, no line numbers. They're not required if you're not referencing lines in basic. So it's all fun and games, but that's basically how this works. And we should be able to run. Yeah, that works fine. We can escape. Uh, let's discard that. One final thing I'll show you, and we're going to do this, uh, cover this in much more depth on the Wi-Fi Sheep channel at a later date, is I've actually got the basic code for a text adventure. It was called um, Silver Mountain, and it was released in the 80s by Osborne Books. And it's one of these type in, uh, you base out the book, you type the listing in, and uh, you can play the game. So here is the listing. Notice the line numbers are back. And that is because there are statements here that reference the lines. So hopefully, there we go, we can actually play this. So we'll start a new game. And it's 
not massively thrilling, but so we go. W, notice how if you don't have uppercase on it, it doesn't recognise where you wanted to go. So you're at a bridge, you can go east, east, uh, no, north, and you kind of get the idea of how that would work. When we're done, we can hit escape, and there we go. One thing I did do, and I have it here in a zip, is I did create a full-blown app out of that code. So let's just click and drag that onto here. So you see it now has an icon and has an exclamation mark, which signifies it's an app, or what we call a pling. If I shift and double click, it actually opens it as a folder, and I have an obey run file. I have that source code, which is pretty much here. And you see how um, it just uh, said that line numbers can't be stripped because they are being referenced. And we have an obey file, which is a text file, a bit like a system command. Uh, I'm trying to think, like a bat file on Windows. So that's kind of how that works. And what we can add is we double click, and I've added a little bit of a front end to it, so we press space bar to continue, and then it's pretty much the same game as seen before. So there's lots of possibilities here with risk and we're really hoping that new developers will come on board and either port code over or we'll want to start writing games or apps for the system. And we're going to be covering this in more detail on Wi-Fi Sheep and also as part of the risk Direct video series. Well, I hope you enjoyed that brief demonstration of coding on the platform. Again, as I said, we'll be covering that in more detail at a later date. Right, I think it's time for another break, and we'll be back real soon. You're watching Wi-Fi Sheep live from the Southwest Computer Show. Thanks for being with us. Welcome back to Wi-Fi Sheep live from the Southwest Computer Show. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for all of you that have stayed with us throughout the entire day. If you have enjoyed Broadcast and want to support us, please consider joining us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep. There's lots of extras and perks available if you join, and you can join for as little as one US dollar. If you haven't done already, please do like and subscribe to us on Wi-Fi Sheep. There will be a highlights program or version of this live broadcast going up shortly. And also, you can follow us there for update and new episodes of Risk OS Direct. The time is just coming up to 4 p.m. GMT. On behalf of everyone here at the Southwest computer show i would like to say thank you once again for your company really hope you enjoyed the broadcast and i hope to see you real soon wherever you are in the world this has been wi-fi sheep live a very good night